Good morning or good afternoon, depending where in the world you are joining us from. The Middle East Institute is honored to welcome you to today's event, Why Lebanon Matters and Innovative Solutions for Sustainable Change. As we speak, the conflict between Hezbollah and Israel is intensifying with much uncertainty over what comes next. The past year has seen Lebanon navigate its concurrent crises, including the Port of Beirut blast, an economic and financial meltdown with only a caretaker government and without a president, a central bank governor, and soon a head of the army. The Gaza war and its rapid spillover into Lebanon added one more new crisis to the country's already overwhelming calamities. An active conflict and the real and present risk of a full-scale war with Israel, pushing the country further in its long decline into a failed quasi-authoritarian state. To help us unpack what is in store for Lebanon and what can be done to avert the worst, we are lucky to have the expertise of Ambassador Edward M. Gabriel, President and CEO of the American Task Force for Lebanon. Firas Maksad, Senior Fellow and Director of Strategic Outreach here at the Middle East Institute. Lami Ambayad, President of the Institut de Finances Basif Lehan, and Patricia Karam, Senior Policy Advisor on Iran from Freedom House. Thank you all for joining us. Now, to give you a quick note for the format of today's webinar, we're going to dive in to uh, our panelists with two series of questions. So for our audiences eager to ask questions, the third section uh, will be open for Q&A. With that, let's dive into what I think everyone is here for, and that's the expertise of our panelists. So to kick off our discussion, I was hoping I could turn to you, Firas, and hopefully you could give us a breakdown of the increasingly complex security situation that is taking place between Lebanon and Israel. How would you assess the likelihood of a full-scale conflict, and what are some of the variables that may lead to such a scenario? Well, first of all, Nick, thank you for uh, having such an illustrious group here today and having me amongst them. It's a pleasure. Uh, as you know, I just got off the plane last night from the region, including from Beirut, where I had a series of meetings. Uh, I am afraid to share that, in fact, while I was um, generally optimistic before heading out on this trip, that the conflict on the Lebanon-Israel border remains contained contained because um, neither the Lebanese or Hezbollah, Iran also an active player, have an interest in a direct full-on confrontation. And, and because Israel has its hands full in, in Gaza, uh, doing very difficult and devastating, if you're a Palestinian, street-to-street uh, -street combat, uh, and with great US pressure being applied on Israel, not to expand this war and, and take the fight to Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. As I said, I walked away uh, more concerned, uh, having uh, heard uh, what uh, folks on the ground have to say. I think there's a, fa the first, a false sense of normalhood uh, or normalcy uh, that is setting in, that uh, that war it will be contained to border skirmishes. Uh, however, uh, the tone is changing on both sides of that border. Uh, and as some of you might be aware, there are Israeli ultimatums that have been communicated to Beirut uh, through a number of, of envoys, French in particular, that came and visited with Lebanese officials in the last few days. And I think sort of maybe there's an underappreciation, particularly amongst the Lebanese on the Hezbollah side of the border, of just how much pressure also the Israeli government is in to change uh, the status quo up north. Uh, I, I heard quite a bit, uh, particularly in, in some of the meetings that I had in Doha on the way back, uh, that there is no going back from an Israeli standpoint to the pre-October 7th status quo on the border, that there's quite a bit of public pressure on the Israeli government. Uh, uh, simply put, thousands and thousands of Israelis who resided in these border communities up north uh, are not willing to go back, uh, are not willing to go back and risk a situation uh, of happen that would, could ha could befall them, similar to what happened to uh, Israelis in the south, uh, and so there's a push to to get Hezbollah to redeploy, uh, according to UN Security Council Resolution 1701, north of the Litani, uh, and I'm simply not optimistic at 
at all that Hezbollah is, is open or that, again, has an appreciation for the kind of pressure that the Israeli government is under uh, to have uh, Hezbollah removed or, or withdraw from that border. Uh, so I say the chances of, of uh, that border uh, igniting in, in a much more significant way than we've seen in the last two and a half months is certainly more than 50% at this point. Uh, I was much more optimistic before my visit. But I do think that there's certainly room for diplomacy. The French are at it. Uh, the French do not have the kind of leverage uh, that we do here in Washington. Uh, and so I think it's of utmost importance that folks like Amos Hochstein uh, and others go back to the region, uh, go back to Lebanon. Uh, Amos Hochstein enjoys credibility and trust on both sides of that border and has uh, a track record, a successful track record of negotiating between two, the two sides. Most importantly, the demarcation of the maritime uh, uh, borders in October of, of last year. Um, I'll stop at that. I'm happy to share more uh, of what that could look like, what that sort of diplomatic off-ramp that the US can play a lead role in, in building for both parties to avert the broadening of this conflict could look like, what elements it might include, but I'll stop here and I'll, I'll leave it to my panelists. Thank you, Fidas, and we're certainly going to get back to that, and I'm sure in the Q&As we're going to get some questions from our audience about the different sort of pathways and pressure points or leverage, tools of leverage of the different international stakeholders. As important as it is to sort of keep an eye on future prospects we can't lose sight of the present, and there is an ongoing conflict. So let me turn to you, Lamia, now. How do the simultaneous crises in Lebanon exacerbate the vulner vulnerability of those impacted by the ongoing conflict, particularly concerning the country's already existing challenges and limited social protection mechanisms? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for uh, this uh, important panel at this very critical time. Um, yes, Lebanon, it is a most vulnerable country today, and it is facing chronic structural challenges, multiple crises that are becoming more interconnected, more intense over time. Um, we know all that the real gross GDP has been contracting uh, continuously to levels that we haven't seen before, 34% between 2018 and 222, wiping out more than 15 years of economic growth and development. But the most important thing is that Lebanon Human Development Index has hit its lowest point since 2015, only last year, and this is a record according, of course, to UNDP. Uh, this, all this will is gonna have long lasting effect on any potential growth as the country physical, human, social, and institutional capital are being rapidly and potentially alarmingly depleted uh, and for a long time, probably a reverse. So the reliance on external financing to help recover from these crises is total. In the current state of the public finance, the response to any disaster will be extremely expensive for the country. That, if accessible, will be more and more expensive to service and infrastructure to rebuild again will be more expensive. Uh, given that there will be large needs and there are large needs elsewhere in Ukraine, probably post-conflict Gaza and other zones, uh, the overseas or official development assistance from partner countries may not stretch as far as Lebanon may want it to be, and accessing the financing will be more, more difficult. On the social protection front, we have lots of reasons for concern because anyway, spending on social protection is at its, let's say, um, life low. It's um, a not more than 6% 6, 6 of GDP uh, for the past years. This is below the global spending of all other lower income countries. And the, of course, the crisis has prompted the intervention of all the international community on many fronts. And um, there are many systems uh, that are looking more like a charity-based mechanism rather than 
uh, any, um, if you want, co contributory schemes, which renders everything risky and extremely fragile with the confluence of conflicts, the displacement that Lebanon is likely to face in the event of any um, uh, any crisis. So yes, um, um, this is a, a, a very um, dangerous point. Thank you, Lamia. Um... I can already see some questions uh, with much sort of concern about this sort of deep and pervasive economic crisis and the widening vulnerability in the country. Um, Patricia, you know, we started off talking about this wider leadership void that um, exacerbates sort of the concern that Lebanon is going further and descending further into to avoid. Now, the presidential vacuum comes within a wider leadership crisis. The country is being led only by a caretaker government and soon no head of the army. Can you give us some insight into the state of this leadership crisis and any relationship or impact between the ongoing conflict and the widening vacuum that we talked about? Thank you, Nick. Thanks. And as you pointed out, there is indeed uh, no president and has not been one for almost a year. And there's a we have a care, caretaker government with limited power and soon no head of army on January 10. At the same time, I mean, this is in a context of, uh, I mean, Lamia pointed out very well, Lebanon suffering its worst ever sort of economic crisis, meaning that if there's another war, uh, Lebanon may not get a chance to recover. So no, nothing has changed. Uh, Lebanon's polarized landscape has really uh, has made it especially difficult to find a compromise between two opposing factions and form a functioning government. And without uh, and without a compromise, no no movement forward is possible. As you know, the only way to sort of circumvent the routine quorum busting that's, that happens in parliament and uh, really elect a president is for key players to really agree on a candidate in advance. And here, uh, without really uh, the agreement of Hezbollah, which has a grip on its allies um, in the electoral game and really the possibility of uh, blocking any vote, we have continued stasis. But let me ask this, does it matter? I mean, Le Lebanon in some ways has had a structurally, a structurally weak state since inception. And this really became explicit with Ta'if. You really have the Second Republic, which uh, introduced the Troika, which meant that no decision could really be taken without the three presidents, the head of state, the head of government, the head of parliament, without them three being in agreement. So any decision of any value really required consensus and fundamentally enshrining a structurally uh, weak state. So while the absence of a president at many levels isn't good, especially uh, where international credibility is concerned, uh, keep in mind that every transition in Lebanon has come with a vacuum, vacuum uh, during which really nothing has changed. Uh, but, but the vacuum provides fodder for political screens. But by this, I mean that uh, when the crisis could have really prompted leaders to take uh, necessary action to really unlock the paralysis, it has actually given them an excuse not to do so and to put off key reforms on which, in particular, a much needed uh, bailout uh, is conditioned, on which is conditioned a much needed bailout that uh, would help stop the economic meltdown. So in, at some level, uh, you know, uh, Lebanon's leader with, with what Firas actually described as, uh, as uh, this, uh, this sense of, uh, I forget what you called it, apathy, inertia, or, or um, the Lebanese leaders are really back to the same level of inaction, um, having, having with, the same, with the danger of war seemingly neutralized the same level of inaction that really defines uh, business as usual in Lebanon. And of course, as Lamia pointed out, in the meantime, Lebanon continues to undergo grow this irreversible sort of economic and demographic degrade de degradation and general impoverishment, 
and uh, deteriorating health and education systems. Again, forget what would happen if war actually happened. There is also the fact that while the majority of the country have, uh, to tie it a bit to the crisis, have, have sort of vocally opposed opening a front with Israel, including the prime minister and others, and really urged Hezbollah from refraining, uh, from escalating the situation, they are really cognizant that uh, the decision that uh, the decision to go to war rests not doesn't really rest in their hands. And now Hezbollah, which had faced a crisis of legitimacy in the past of it over its uh, role in Syria, over its positions uh, on uh, the anti-government protests, or over its uh, role in the Beirut uh, port blast. Uh, has really by by taking this position of simultaneously dissociating itself uh, from the war, but also raid, riding the, the wave of outrage at the civilian death toll from the Israeli attack on Gaza, has really, this has really bolstered its resistance uh, cr credential even uh, beyond its traditional uh, audiences. Uh, I think I'll stop here, Nick, and we can... Uh, maybe pick up on some of those elements in a, in a second round of questions. We definitely will, Patricia, thank you. And I, as I mentioned, I, I think your comments have generated already, I can see some questions and some thought from our audiences. And I uh, thank our audience members watching. You can just type your questions. I will bring them up to our, our esteemed panelists in the third segment. I wanna now turn to Ambassador Gabriel. Thank you for joining us and bringing with us your global perspective. Uh, and perhaps you might help us unpack a question that I know looms large. As the conflict escalates and the specter of a larger crisis becomes more pronounced, what specific role can the United States play at this critical juncture to contribute to resolution and stability? Thank you, Nick, and thank you, MEI, for this uh, important uh, seminar. And it's great to be with such a uh, distinguished group of panelists. Um, let me just uh, dive into this um, and maybe um, wholly agree with Faraz's uh, assessment, um, and then maybe add a little color to it as well. Um, I believe that the only way to stop this escalation at this point is uh, for intervention by the United States diplomatically. Um, so let's look at this. Um, what you have is um, Iran right now appears to not want to escalate. Um, it has shown uh, very little interest, at least on the Lebanese border, to do so. And they've sent many signals in that regard. Um, I think the general feeling is any major escalation will be at their decision um, uh, using Hezbollah. Um, that's not to say that Hezbollah is not going to miscalculate uh, and do something that could be that could really um, advance escalation. Having said that, on the Israeli side, it's um, also clear, in my opinion, and that is um, they're itching to escalate. Um, you've heard uh, Gallant on the first day of the war um, say that we should pre that Israel should preempt Hezbollah and bomb them. Um, last week, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was on the border saying we're going to turn Lebanon into Gaza. Um, uh, the United States knows this, and um, Secretary of Defense uh, Austin, President uh, Biden, really in his first visit there, in his visit there really uh, step back Gallant's uh, desires. Um, uh, Amos Hochstein, the personal envoy of the president, President uh, Biden, um, is wholly charged with trying to bring some stability to that border and not to escalate. So there is a, a real interest and I think hope uh, that the United States can assert itself a little better. Now, having said that, Israel doesn't seem to be um, Taking, uh, taking the advice of the United States when it comes to this war. Um, as you can see in the last few days, President Biden has really um, opposed uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu on a number of, uh, of fronts and 
Netanyahu has turned around and said there will not ever be a Palestinian authority in charge of Palestine um, or a two-state solution. So they're beginning to separate their feelings, separate from each other in terms of how they view this war. Um, Israel continues to use white phosphorus bombs, uh, bombing 40,000 trees in, 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 in Lebanon. Um, they've killed innocent people there. Um, and I think Firas is right. Um, right now, I think uh, Huxty needs, in the immediate term, Huxty needs to really look at how the United States can double down on 1701, insert the international community through UNIFIL and through 1701 to really get um, the two sides to back off while the international community tries to put more teeth and attention into 1701. Um, I think that's something that can be done uh, pretty quickly. Um, of course, the longer term, we can look at demarcating the border, but I don't think that's anything that's going to happen in the short term or even the mid, uh, medium term, as well as, you know, what is our uh, policy moving forward on Iran, with Iran? Again, that's longer term, and there's a need for more of a muscular uh, view on Iran. So let me start stop there and say that I'm very concerned about the potential for escalation, about the about the uh, the obvious uh, reaction by Israel um, and what they seem to be wanting to escalate. At the same time, not taking the U.S. advice as strictly as we would hope for, and there seems to be only one way forward to really stop this escalation, and I believe it's with U.S. intervention diplomatically. Thank you, Ambassador Gabriel. Um, I want to sort of start off the second um, segment here with you as well, given, you know, much and to sort of bring a context for our audience in Washington uh, that may be looking at Lebanon and looking at the United States amidst numerous global challenges. Um, and perhaps a question here that we should ask is what strategic considerations underline Lebanon's significance as a priority for the U.S.? And how does addressing the situation that you just described align with broader U.S. foreign policy objectives? Well, um, let me say this. Um, let me first tell you why um, Lebanon should be a first-tier country for the United States and then tell you why it isn't. Um, you know, I, there's some obvious uh, points here. One, it's, you know, one of the few democratic states in the Arab world and has the potential with a multicultural um, group uh, of citizens to really, uh, you know, really present itself as uh, a country of change and reform. And it has a very educated uh, population, one that's really affected through education and other vehicles, the rest of the region in more of a reform-minded fashion. Um, uh, they also are, uh, you know, important to the Eastern Mediterranean in protecting um, U.S. and regional interest, uh, given where it is geographically. Uh, can you imagine if Lebanon were um, in the total hands of Iran right now, what that would mean to stability in the region. So I think geographically, there's importance there. Um, and also we've invested in the Lebanese Armed Forces. Um, and I think it's really important for us to continue that process because it is the one institution that is capable of protecting the territorial integrity. Let me just step back for a second, though, uh, something I should have mentioned in, the, in my last comment. You know, LAF has stood down, um, I think, uh, uh, smartly from um, bringing Lebanon into this uh, dispute with Israel. But in the process, Patricia's point has really um, surfaced, and that is Hezbollah is looking like the protector of in the region. So I think it's really important for the United States to also um, bolster the, the LAF 
and supported in, in many different ways. Now, having said that, unfortunately, uh, we don't ever look at Lebanon as a first tier consideration unless it affects our other interests. Um, back in the 80s and 90s, we cared about Syria and bringing peace to the region and a peace agreement with Syria. And we you know, put Lebanon to the side on that. Um, We've we've had the uh, you know uh, uh, bombing in uh, in 1982 and 83 um, that really affected um, Lebanon and U.S. interests there and our own uh, troops. And until that happened, we didn't assert ourselves there. Um, and you can see as we move forward to uh, to more current events uh, when it affects uh, our interest with regard to the Gulf or Iran they become more of interest to us, and especially when it, when it regards uh, Israel. For instance, right now, Lebanon is in the news every day, is, uh, and it's for one reason, because of our interest with Israel. So I think the United States has to look at itself as it comes and goes uh, with a policy that uh, affects Lebanon um, and whether or not it's doing good or bad by coming and going, and whether or not it really needs a more strategic viewpoint based upon the assets that this country has. Thank you, Ambassador. With our title being Why Lebanon Matters, you've certainly made a compelling case for it. Um, Firas, I, I want to now turn to you. You've mentioned you came from this regional trip, and I want to sort of draw from your regional perspective. Considering the potential, as we've heard, for a full-scale conflict, whether directly stemming from the Gaza-Israel war or as a consequence of unaddressed underlying drivers, what impact could this have on regional stability in both the short and long term? And to what extent would you say these potential consequences influence the way regional players are evaluating the strategic significance of Lebanon? Well, well, thank you for that question, Nick. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and answer it, but uh, in the process, also kind of add to what Ambassador Gabriel put on the table about the importance and significance of Lebanon uh, for U.S. strategic interests. Um, I would say that I would characterize U.S. foreign policy as it relates to the Middle East as one that is first and foremost interested in stability right now. Uh, there is very little interest in the administration in sideshows that uh, preclude the administration from paying utmost attention to great power competition, uh, the rise of China, and certainly an active war on the European continent, military resources, financial, significant financial resources being deployed uh, to Ukraine. And so the last thing the administration is looking forward to right now is a major regional conflict uh, in the Middle East. Lebanon uh, has the ability to deliver just that. Uh, it should the crisis on the border go unaddressed. Uh, and therefore, whether you are um, sitting in the White House or whether you are even sitting in the Gulf. I mentioned I was in Doha, I was uh, also in Riyadh and Jeddah before that. And uh, these countries uh, are undergoing transformative uh, economic and, and, and social programs that are anchored on the premise of, of stability. Uh, where there is much instability surrounding them, whether in Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and do not want to see that kind of, um, of configuration take place, let alone also the impact that that might have on the ongoing effort to normalize relationship with Israel, um, and a war with Lebanon, uh, to adding on to what is happening with, in Gaza and the daily images of the suffering of Palestinians, that makes it that much more difficult for these uh, countries, particularly these Arab Gulf countries, to proceed in normalizing their diplomatic relations uh, with Israel. So for all those reasons, there's uh, American and uh, Arab interest in precluding such a war. Um, 1701, UN Security Council Resolution 1701 is key and ought to be the cornerstone of any diplomatic initiative. However, that initiative will certainly not be without its challenges. Ambassador Gabriel is absolutely right that there's almost, as a, a senior U.S. official put it to me uh, two days ago, uh, there's almost daily, constant, persistent U.S. pressure on Israel not to open a second front in Lebanon. 
Uh, that, however, runs against the grain of the domestic political realities in Israel and the fact that tens of thousands of Israelis no longer feel safe returning to that border. And so th something needs to be done. The situation is not sustainable. And it's equally unrealistic to demand of Hezbollah, as the Israelis uh, have, and some of the uh, French envoys that visited recently, to withdraw north of the Litani after Hezbollah is, has spent decades uh, entrenching itself uh, on that border uh, with very little action, I might add, very little effective action uh, by Israel, thousands of UN troops, and subsequent Lebanese governments. So to demand that of Hezbollah now and threaten war, I don't think is something that is 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 realistic. So there needs to be a diplomatic off-ramp. And I think where there might be some daylight between me and Ambassador Gabriel is I think that the issue of demarcating that border uh, has to be one that is part of that solution, perhaps the necessary fig leaf for Hezbollah to redeploy at least its its top its top forces, its you know elite Radwan forces, some six thousand strong north of the Litani, and I think um, Shiva in the grander scheme of things, uh, you know, a disputed territory between uh, Syria and, and Lebanon, which has which uh, Israel did not withdraw from in, in the year two thousand. I think it matters much less to Israeli public opinion than having Hezbollah successfully redeployed away from that border, similarly with North Rajar and some of these key points. But it will require tough diplomacy. Uh, and as long as Israel continues to take undertake military action in Gaza, it will be difficult for Hezbollah to completely disengage uh, and this, these skirmishes on the border to come to an end. But we can begin to lay the groundwork for the day after. Uh, and again, uh, here I emphasize the need for US diplomatic initiative uh, to buttress and support that the, that the French have already begun to undertake. Thank you, Firas. Um, I'm sure in the Q&A, we're gonna get a lot of follow-up uh, and questions to probe you on further on what you've shared with us. We've heard, you know, an international, you know, the, the perspective from Washington, the regional perspective. I don't want to lose sight of the local perspective, as well as the multifaceted crisis context in Lebanon. So I was hoping I could turn to you, Lamia, and ask you, in what ways does the ongoing conflict exert a broader impact on Lebanon's crisis hit economy? How do you interpret and contextualize these effects within the backdrop of Lebanon's prolonged crisis? Sure. Uh, uh, let me first just take a little, you know, turn um, with a again a local flavor, but also a from somebody who is working on for the past eight years on Agenda 2030, which is the end of hope, advising the UN in my um, capacity as member of this uh, UN uh, ECOSOC advisory body. We're working on SDG 16, the rule of law, uh, strong institutions and peace building. And today, and from a local, regional and global perspective, we see the US soft power and credibility really here at test. Uh, because on the U.S. depends uh, the changing course in Gaza and preventing and expanding the war to Lebanon. And most people like me who were educated for generations at the American University of Beirut who have raised their children to be interlocutor for the future, for a peaceful future, for a stable future, they are asking the same question. When will when will the U.S. be sufficiently outraged to insist and demand on, on the rule of law on stated, as stated by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which we uh, celebrated a few days ago? Uh, and, 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 and only yesterday, six heads of major humanitarian organization, Care USA, Mercy Corps, Norwegian Refugee Council, Oxfam America, they all insisted on, uh, on the U.S. government to change course in, in its unconditional support to, to Israel. So it's a fight for, for, for not only Lebanon, it's a fight for, for global peace, for humanity, for global stability. And of course, uh, uh, we as, as local and, and also international people will have to um, look at what will come next, what will the future of, of, of peace and 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 
uh, stability in the whole world is going to be, what kind of words we are leaving for our children. What is happening will be engraved in the DNA of the future generations, uh, uh, killing all prospects for, for any peaceful encounters. And I think this is what is at stake. From, from Lebanon is 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 getting destroyed by the by the day again and by a lot of its own wrongdoing. But again, uh, uh, expecting it to to just um, uh, be a place where eventually any confluence of peaceful idea uh, is being killed with the economy, with the collapse of the institutions, and with uh, um, the extreme uh, conditions that people are, are living in, you cannot expect to restore tourism today or to think about uh, agriculture, agricultural prospects or, uh, or any kind of economic uh, uh, um, restructuring, again, uh, with or without IMF program, uh, we cannot think of any prospects unless there is a prospect of peace and stability in the region. And this largely depends on the U.S. stand. Thank you, Lamia. You, you've really helped me sort of sort of lead the way. And, and I'm sorry, Patricia, I'm going to put this, this pressure on you to sort of bring forward the last question that is rooted in this question of legitimacy. And I want to ask you, Patricia, how, how do you assess the Lebanese government's response to the conflict? And how has this response impacted its local and international legitimacy and standing? All the easy questions. <laughs> uh, Nick, you know, you it won't be you won't be uh, surprised to hear me say that uh, you know the government's response to the conflict has been in some ways inept at best, but in many ways, uh, it's irrelevant. The, the government's response is in some ways, and based on what we've heard to date from Firas, from Ed, from others, uh, is somewhat irrelevant in this conflict. Uh, and it knows it isn't the decision maker. Now, of course, the political leaders, as I mentioned, from all walks of life in some ways have openly opposed the war, which we know Le Lebanon can ill afford. Uh, I mean, even the, you know, Gibran Basil, the FPM leader who's allied with Hezbollah, uh, you know, announced that uh, all Lebanese people agree they don't want war. Uh, and of course, you have the, the, the uh, Lebanese forces who also uh, warned Hezbollah not to drag Lebanon into war that, and, and etc. And Miati has also been clamoring the prime minister uh, about the need to avoid a war that is in nobody's interest. The patriarch, other have all said the right thing, things, balancing humanity, calling for peace. But the question is whether any of these noises are reaching anyone's ears or if they will change anyone's mind. And so my sense, and I believe that Lebanon will ultimately, and, and it sort of tracks with what, what people have said on this panel, that Lebanon will ultimately be collateral damage, which is a function of what Hezbollah does and what Israel does. So what is clear is that on the Lebanese side, the decision to go to war rests not in the caretaker hands, uh, uh, caretaker government's hands, but in the, the hands of Hezbollah, which was the actor who is the actor with the most sway over uh, Lebanese politics. And who, as I mentioned, you know, whose raison d'etre has been sort of its resistance against Israel. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and I did, and again, I, I, I did mention at the risk of repeating myself uh, that Nasrallah has, has managed to reap the benefits of involvement without being involved or risking a war. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, at the same time, uh, as Firas pointed out, um, you know, there's increased uh, sense of warmongering on the on the Israel side, for lack of a better word, or pressure internally for for more assertive uh, Israeli action. Uh, and so Lebanon's involvement to date has really been confined, you know, to the south where uh, where the border has been stirred up. But anything is really possible, uh, depending on things, uh, how things unfold and uh, what uh, Iran decides and what and Israel's actions uh, in response or or as a result. Thank you, thank you very much, Patricia. Um, I I want to sort of now turn the floor to our audience. I want to sort of 
take this moment to re-explain the rules of the Q&A. You just need to type your question in the chat Q&A. Um, and uh, if you want to sort of raise it to a particular panelist, you can type their name and I'll raise it to them. Uh, I'll start off with a question I see here. Uh, one of the sort of questions, uh, and this is directed to you, Patricia, is we've seen uh, it's sort of a pushback on the narrative that the lack of election of a president is not simply due to the absence of consensus, but Hezbollah wielding uh, the tool of obstruction, uh, that it largely obstructed the presidential file. Um, what I'm sort of getting from this question is, how is the United States not taking a more active sort of role in breaking that chokehold? Rookie mistake, <laughs> not unmuting. Um, you know, I don't, I mean, that, that the United States question may be one for Ed, but, um, you know, I addressed this in my initial remarks. I, I, yes, yes, the country is hostage to Hezbollah in, in a lot of ways, you know, because they're blocking the election of a president. That's at the heart of the issue, but it's also because the system allows it. You know, we have a system that requires uh, consensus because you have this two uh, two session uh, election process that requires you know a quorum and, and what happens in the second one they walk out you know so uh, you you know effectively you know uh, consensus is required and yes uh, you know as a result we're hostage because the the actors who are blocking uh, you know who are or who are blocking the system are Hezbollah and its allies so. Yes, so, the U.S., I don't know, maybe uh, maybe yeah, Ed wants so maybe, to... Yeah, maybe building on that, I'll direct that to you, Ambassador Gabriel. What what are some pathways uh, or, or role the U.S. can play uh, to counterweight or be a counterforce against that weaponized obstruction that we're hearing Patricia talk about? So um, let me just um, kind of react to what I've been hearing. Um, this morning, I think there's a great agreement here. Um, Lamia, Patricia, Firas all mentioned the need for U.S. leadership. Um, and as Lamia said, that's not to take away from the responsibilities of Lebanon. Um, it goes without saying. Um, but in this case, again, um, I think it takes U.S. leadership. Look, the Quint has come together. There are five countries, U.S., France, Egypt, uh, Qatar, and Saudi, um, and, and on a process. That process has had come together. The Quint had come to agreement prior to October 7th um, that uh, Qatar would take the lead, come to, the, uh, to Lebanon, um, and explain to all the parties that the current candidates were no longer viable. I think that was code for Frangia needs to step down. Uh, and that the parties really needed to come together uh, and, and, um, and finding a consensus. Patricia and I were there that week uh, leading up to the war. We met with uh, uh, Speaker Barry and every faction. We met with more than uh, 40 parliamentarians and um, faction leaders, uh, party leaders. Um, and there seemed to be some consensus on the Quint leadership um, and um, also with the need to drop the current um, candidate and have a um, discussion. Unfortunately, the war happened. Um, and as Firas told us earlier, um, that, you know, uh, Qatar got very busy on, on the war. Uh, and unfortunately, this has dropped by the wayside. We have been meeting with the White House and the State Department saying we can't wait for the war to be over. The U.S. needs to reaffirm the Quint's desire to get this done and get um, at least Cutter in there to assess our view of the situation, that there seems to be a consensus building for finding a consensus, President. Um, we hope that will happen. But again, you know, we're pushing a, a, a snowball up a hill. Um, and it's been very, very hard to um, 
to get the United States to assert its leadership in that regard. It's very hard. We also want the U.S. to assert its leadership on the border. We talked about that. And on really um, moving the IMF reforms at some point, um, it's going to take U.S. leadership and only U.S. leadership at this point. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Ambassador Gabriel. I think the the point of U.S. leadership and you know you helping us highlight how that has been a clear motif of today's discussion uh, certainly stands out. I want to perhaps then direct this question to you, Firas, uh, because it helps sort of it sort of touches on some of the the themes you are discussing. Once the Israel Gaza war is over, uh, what reassurances will Israel have? Um, and let me combine two questions I see in front of me, that Hezbollah will not take a similar sort of or attack on Israel, or that reassures Israeli deterrence uh, after October 7. So I'll stop with that, that question to you, Fios. Yeah, listen, I, I think that's an important question. Um, and I think that's why uh, the United States and France both have a key role to play as the guarantors of any possible diplomatic off-ramp that is anchored in UN Security Council, Council Resolution 1701. Uh, I think um, I would expect that Israeli leaders in Jerusalem would, would very much challenge the premise of a diplomatic off-ramp by, by questioning uh, the credibility of Hezbollah actually adhering to such an agreement, given that Hezbollah did not adhere to UN Security Council Resolution 1701. Uh, so again, I, I, see a, I see a pivotal role here for guarantees being provided by the U.S. and, and France. I think similarly, uh, Hezbollah would also ask what is in it for them. And so the current premise or the current ultimatums that are being delivered on behalf of, of Israel of simply just asking Hezbollah to remove itself uh, off that border after decades and decades of entrenching itself are unrealistic, and one would have to ask what Hezbollah can expect uh, in return. Not that I would want Hezbollah to have anything in return. It's just the simple reality of, of, of the situation on the ground. Uh, I would also sort of hear a, maybe a, a side note that relates very much to the discussion about unlocking the gridlock uh, at the very head of the Lebanese state in terms of the presidency. I would I will put it past Hezbollah. Uh, that they would also want to cash in on a price internally in Lebanon, that they would very much would want to see their candidate uh, nominated and elected as president as part of any such potential understanding. Uh, so there are going to be many challenges to this, uh, this diplomatic route, uh, but it needs to get going uh, because I think we all agree that the, the status quo is, is unsustainable and the consequences and the fallout from what might befall both Lebanon and Israel would put what's happening in Gaza as difficult and tragic as it is uh, would make it would make it seem as a sideshow. Thank you, thank you, Firas. Um, I we're gonna. I can see already some pushback. I ask those are for our audiences. Please don't raise your hands. You can just type your questions, and I'll read them for you. Um, I want to sort of jump first because I see an economic question to you, Lamia. Uh, how has the conflict affected uh, not just stability in Lebanon, but confidence in its economy? Uh, and I know you, you sort of touched a bit on this in your talk, um, but what I can see underlying in the question is uh, to the point we're raising, who would still invest in Lebanon right now, given you know the combination of protracted crisis, and the looming uncertainty of a full-scale conflict? Um, I mean, uh, um, definitely those who are huge risk takers, let's put it this way. Um, but uh, clearly, this is not an economy that is, you know, uh, a sound or a healthy economy, of course, with all the prospects that are, th are there. Um, let us not forget that uh, most, most government functions are in a very dire state, and these are extremely important for, for any economy to function. The banking sector is still, you know, in a collapsed mode. 
uh, and this does not help any um, uh, real um, transparent and uh, uh, efficient uh, uh, financing of the economy. So it's uh, it bascule and it goes to the dark side which with cash economy flourishing. Uh, I think that um, there will be a lot of job to be done, a lot of work to be done, like we all know, on restoring core government functions and notably in policy formulation and in public financial management, which is an area that's mostly forgot, but it is the core area where you could have better planning, budgeting and spending and better trust in the system of, of taxation, of controls, of oversight. So central government management needs to really take a, a, um, a, a good, you know, refurbishing and restructuring before thinking about, you know, sound and healthy investment. Lack of capacity today is uh, erosion of talent is, is, I think, the biggest threat to any future prospect. But um, uh, if there are points to start, it would be restoring core government function with a focus on, of course, the security sector. LAF is a very important uh, uh, institution to preserve. And like, like Ambassador Ed pointed out, it enjoys the trust of the Lebanese people. Justice is a, a sector that needs a, a, a serious, a serious revamp and definitely um, a designing of more inclusive social protection system in the future, which can extend coverage with priority to the poor, to the most vulnerable areas. Unless this is done, there will be um, a difficult prospect for moving in, uh, into a, um, an economy that encourages private sector, uh, formal private sector, foreign investors, uh, uh, and we will continue going more and more into informality, which brings with it a lot of risks uh, to the country. Let me just, there's just a follow-up question for you here, Lamia. At this stage, what's the, what would you say is the feasibility of the IMF reforms? Well, Frank, at the time being, it's at its uh, uh, lowest, uh, you know, degree of probability, and uh, unless there is a political process that is in place with a clear leadership, political leadership, and political commitment to an IMF program, nothing will be moved. But even with that, you will need to have some internal capacity at the level of Lebanon to work with the IMF so that we could restore some fiscal discipline first and foremost and moving into more serious stuff. Thank you, Lenny. I want to turn to Ambassador Gabriel. You have your hand raised, so I want to give you the floor, Ambassador. I want to agree with Lamini and just add one thing, really build on what she just said, and that is we also have to empower the local communities. Um, IMF is going to be a while, and any and for this government to really operate efficiently in addressing the needs of the people is going to take more time. Even with an IMF program, it'll take a couple of years for the people to feel uh, feel the effects. In the meantime, they can begin decentralized programming. Let's let's take solar for instance, where we could bring electricity to municipalities. Um, the, for instance. Primary and secondary schools in Lebanon use up uh, 60% of their budget for electricity. Can you imagine what a solar project could do to a community school, uh, for instance, water treatment, um, uh, health services, the list goes on and on. So I just want to add the need to empower local communities to take care of themselves for now. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Patricia, I just want to sort of turn to you with a question on mediation regarding the presidential file. And I'll open it up if any of our other panelists have thoughts on this. Uh, but giving all this talk about mediation on preventing a conflict between or a full-scale conflict between Lebanon and Israel, uh, how can there be, you know, a deal that doesn't result in Lebanon sort of descending further uh, into a quasi-authoritarian state, if I understood these questions correctly. This is, I mean, maybe this is uh, goes back to what Firas has brought up, that any mediated solution needs to tackle some of the issues and maybe connect the issues. So if there is kind of a deal for Hezbollah to withdraw from the, from the borders, 
there may be something else uh, to be negotiated on the presidential file. So I think one needs to uh, look at the issue holistically and uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, approach it in a in a creative way in some ways. And I do want to reiterate, I do think that, uh, you know, the U.S. needs to be involved and that uh, it doesn't have, uh, I mean, that France, you know, which has been involved so far, doesn't have the kind of sway that the U.S. could have. Maybe Firas and uh, Ed can and can sort of build upon that. Firas, can I turn to you for your thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to chime in here. Um, I, I think there was a decision taken. Listen, there are two, at least two approaches to to tackling this problem of trying to not only fill the void uh, in the presidency, but also these cascading voids within the Lebanese body politics, whether it's the head of the LAF, I believe that the head of the internal security forces, the ISF is also due to retire. We saw the exit of the uh, governor of the Lebanese Central Bank, Riyad Saremi, and that remains sort of a tier one post that is, is unfilled and so on and so forth. Uh, and so one approach is to, to take a, a package approach and to sit across the table from each other. And these issues are all interrelated, including potentially interrelated with what um, might or might not materialize in terms of a, a diplomatic off-ramp for uh, Hezbollah's presence on, on the border. And, and so with that, uh, there is talk of a, a Doha too. Uh, and Ambassador Gabriel mentioned that uh, Qatar has kind of been uh, green-lighted to take the the lead uh, amongst the, the quintet, the group of five nations that are shepherding the Lebanon file. Uh, I think, you know, De Doha II would have been a strong possibility if, if the uh, tragic events in Gaza uh, haven't been unfolding. Uh, but it's still a possibility, perhaps delayed, but still a possibility in early uh, early next year. The other approach is to isolate and to deal with the presidency file separate from that of the LAF commander and separate from that of the central bank. Uh, that might be perhaps a less complex uh, approach. I'm not too sure how effective it could be, but I do uh, think that there is a pivotal role here for foreign uh, leadership, um, not just US, but certainly the French, the Qataris, the Saudis and, and others that have been mentioned. And I would just tell you that sort of given my meetings in, in Beirut last week, it was very clear that there was a, a hard hitting direct message delivered to Lebanese leaders that there cannot be a void at the head of the LAF, the Lebanese army. And to quote, um, you know, the, the message passed on by, I, I will not name, but I think it would be very easy to guess is that there is an international regional consensus on renewing them and extending the mandate of the LAF commander, Joseph Fallon. Uh, and so I think the Lebanese, we see now that the parliament is due to uh, convene uh, this week and, and get that job done. Uh, you never say it's done until it's done, but we'll see. And so I think that there's an important role, an indispensable role here for these countries to play in shepherding the Lebanese along. And there's a question as to whether it could be done as a collective package, given the complexity of the situation or taking it one task at a time. But the Qataris, uh, as Ambassador Gabriel pointed out, have been tasked to take the lead and a Doha II kind of approach had been sort of contemplated, but is now perhaps delayed given the events in Gaza. Thank you, Firas. I wanna just give you the last closing word, Ambassador Gabriel, because I saw your hand raised with the note, we have two minutes left. Uh, but if you're in need of a, a question, perhaps it would give me a last moment for you to sort of retell us why Lebanon matters at this point and what is what is the right path ahead for key stakeholders, particularly the United States, to take. Hey, so let me just uh, back up and um, um, build upon what Patricia and Firas said uh, uh, in regards to the last question. Um, let me let me just tell you, it, whatever deal comes together, and whether it's uh, together or separately, um, it's important um, that the United States not say, you need a president, any president will do right now. You just need a president. I think that would be a fatal mistake. Uh, we've already seen um, 
what a Hezbollah candidate has done for the country, i.e. Michelle Aoun. Um, that wasn't exactly the most productive six years. So whoever's chosen has to be reform-minded, competent, and clean. Um, and there are a lot of those people available. So hopefully any negotiated deal uh, with Hezbollah will find its way within that within that uh, uh, cape, uh, within that framework. Um, regarding Doha II, um, uh, when we were there, uh, we learned um, that, uh, in fact, and I want to underscore this, we learned, in fact, that the opposition and even Speaker Barry were waiting for um, the cutters to come to see what, what they could do to bring everyone together. So there is a great support, it seems, for that process. But uh, just to make the point, whether Doha 2 is the best vehicle or whether there are um, shuttle diplomacy inside Beirut is the answer, is yet to be, I think, um, uh, discussed with all of those factions. I think some of the factions um, are a little nervous about what Doha 1 did and what that kind of signals for Doha 2 or the, at least the image of it. Um, and lastly, I want to also say, end on uh, one point, and that is Lebanon does matter to the United States today. You can see it. Um, let's not forget that one of the president's closest confidants, the personal envoy, Amos Huckstein, has been given this assignment. Um, our support for the LAF has been tremendous, more than $2 billion since 06. Um, the, as Firas kind of uh, indicated, there is a, a great diplomacy going on behind the scenes by the United States to support um, Lebanon. And Lebanon leans towards the West, uh, generally speaking. And so I think there's a, a lot of um, mutuality there and a lot of concern and support for one another. Um, and let me just agree with Firas on one other thing, and that is on the, the need for the border uh, negotiations. Um, we're not in disagreement there. Um, that is really important. What I'm worried about, though, is let's bring this back to today. In the next few days, we've got to stop escalation from occurring. That's number one with us. And um, I think you do that diplomatically with the United States. But you're right. Um, We've got to come in right after that with some very tangible ways to deal with it through 1701, through border negotiations, pressure to elect a president, and uh, bring on new economic reforms. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Gabriel. Certainly with our title focused on innovative solutions, uh, your emphasis on not sort of repeating the mistakes of the past is appreciated. Uh, I want to sort of thank all our panelists for your insight, for your time. Uh, amidst such uncertainty, your perspective, your informed perspective, your nuance, I know at least has brought to me um, not reassurance because I don't want to give false reassurance, uh, but much needed clarity. And for that, I thank you all. I hope our audience members, many of whom uh, Maybe decision makers listen to your guidance. Uh, with that, I thank you for your time. I thank our audience and, of course, the Middle East Institute uh, for hosting this event. Thank you and take care. Thank you, Nick.